1952 was a crucial turning point for Turkey. The country was fighting alongside the U.S. in the Korean War, and it was also the year it joined the NATO military alliance. One of its earliest members, Turkey provided the Western Bloc with a strong foothold to contain Soviet expansion. And since joining, Turkey has been actively involved in almost every major NATO mission. In the early 1990s, as Yugoslavia was breaking apart and ethnic clashes were descending into genocide, Turkey joined NATO operations to protect Bosnians and later Kosovars. Ankara also participated in a NATO-led mission in 2001 to help stabilize Afghanistan after the Taliban's removal. Having the second largest military force in the alliance after the U.S., Turkey has provided crucial manpower and bases to contain threats from the Balkans to the Middle East. But that partnership hasn't always gone both ways. Since the outbreak of the Syrian conflict in 2011, Ankara has criticized some NATO members for not acknowledging security threats facing Turkey. The growing crisis over Ukraine has also exposed long-simmering divisions within the alliance. And to discuss Turkey's role in NATO, I'm joined now from Istanbul by Mustafa Aydin. He is a professor of international relations at Kadir Has University and in Brussels is Samuel Doveri Westerby, the Managing Director of the European Neighborhood Council uh, Research and Policy Think Tank. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk and thank you very much for joining me. Uh, Samuel, what role has Turkey played in NATO over the past 70 years and how crucial is Turkey's role in the organization as of today? Well, Turkey is a, an enormously important um, country within the NATO alliance. And from its inception, uh, it had a, in a very important strategic advantage uh, with regards to its geographical placement in Eurasia. Mm -hmm. uh, most of Anatolia stretches well into, um, um, into the Eurasian uh, continent. And as a result, the Jupiter missiles of the United States were stationed very far into uh, Turkey, which was a, a major advantage uh, for um, for the other NATO allies. At the same time, uh, of course, uh, Turkey both has access to important Eurasian land routes, as well as maritime access to the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, and uh, has therefore played a significant geostrategic role for the alliance uh, over uh, the past uh, 70 years. Yes. In today's context, uh, of course, it's a major <coughs> contributor with 13 uh, million, it's among uh, one of the major contributors yes. to the alliance. And as a result, it's important in that sense as well. So Mustafa, what have been some of the major uh, benefits and challenges Turkey has seen during its membership in NATO? Well, the benefits are quite, uh, quite uh, obvious. Uh, NATO has been the linchpin of Turkey's Western connection. Uh, that has been the only organization where Turkey has equal decision-making power. So that, in that sense, NATO is, has been much more than a military organization for Turkey. It was an identity. It was related to political choice and everything. Uh, on the security aspect, of course, Turkey, uh, the NATO has helped Turkey uh, quite a lot in advancement of its military training, uh, uh, armaments uh, and logistics uh, from perspectives. Uh, on, on the other hand, however, especially since the end of the Cold War, we have been facing a number of uh, divergences with our NATO partners. Yes. Uh, especially some of uh, uh, Turkey's threat perceptions have been uh, changing, uh, especially if we compare it with some of the NATO members. Uh, United States chief among them, but some of the European uh, members as as well. And also the focus of the country, Turkey's focus in its neighborhood, uh, has increased, which has, uh, again, created a divergence with uh, some of the NATO members. And these are the issues that we need to be uh, still tackling yes. uh, and uh, need to overcome. So, Samuel, Turkey has long uh, criticized some uh, NATO members for not recognizing its security threats, especially um, when it comes to terror organizations like the PKK and the YPG. Can you talk about how has this caused uh, divisions uh, in the alliance? 
Well, I, I think that there are unfortunately many divisions within the NATO alliance today, and some are legitimate from Turkey's perspective and some are less legitimate from Turkey's perspective. On the less legitimate side from Turkey's perspective include uh, issues with regards to the arms embargo in Libya, for example, mm -hmm. uh, where there is division between France and Turkey on that front. However, on the more legitimate side uh, lay uh, Turkey's concerns about terrorism from its southern border in Syria. Uh, both of these uh, cases are uh, divisive within NATO today, mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, Turkey has a much stronger standpoint with regards uh, to its security concerns in uh, northern Syria, which date back uh, to well before the Adana Protocol of 1998 and, and, uh, and indeed pose a problem uh, for uh, Turkey today, something which I think some of the alliance members Mm -hmm. uh, would do well to also consider. So, Mustafa, how has the U.S.'s and France's arming of uh, Greece against Turkey hurt the spirit of the alliance and exposed its uh, fragile unity? I mean, have rivalries among the member states uh, been exploited to a certain extent? Well, definitely Russia is quite happy to see the divisions within NATO. Uh, and, uh, and of course, it has the NATO's uh, opposition uh, has always been happy to see uh, the NATO members to fight over uh, among themselves. And of course, Turkey and Greece uh, have conflict going back to the Cold War era. It's not new. Yes. And every time these two countries uh, <laughs> come to loggerheads, other NATO members always get nervous. In recent years, of course, uh, uh, Turkish-Greek uh, relations have been uh, much on a much better footing uh, mm -hmm. until the last summer, where uh, in the, East, the, the conflict in the Eastern Mediterranean, or, or let me say disagreements over the Eastern Mediterranean, turned into a, a real a conflicting uh, cycle yes. and prompted uh, Greece to uh, embark on an armament procedure. Uh, which is very problematic because it might be forcing Turkey also to uh, embark on a new armament cycle. And that, uh, we, as we know, is a kind of a very classical case of conflict cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, it's harming not only the interests of these two countries uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, but it's also harming the interests of NATO uh, countries yes. in the Mediterranean, in the Asian, and the southeastern flank of NATO. It's weakening the uh, NATO cohesion in this region, and especially the role of France is quite important. Not only selling arms, that's one point, but it's, it's the, the French position is going beyond the, uh, selling arms, and they are uh, siding uh, uh, with one of the members of NATO against another member, which is uh, Turkey, obviously. Yes. So uh, it is a problematic as far as the NATO cohesion is concerned as well. So, Samuel, has the U.S. unfairly used NATO as a pressure tactic against Turkey when they have uh, bilateral differences? And to what extent has the purchase of S-400 uh, missiles from Russia hurt NATO's defense capabilities, or did it just hurt the U.S. interests? Well, uh, the purchasing of the S-400s, I think, are... Uh, a, a clear uh, problem for most uh, NATO members in the sense that um, if you look at the communication from the Brussels summit as well as from the Wales summit, uh, Turkey is mentioned, or sorry, uh, Russia is mentioned uh, repeatedly as a malign actor that creates problems for the alliances. And as a result, it has been very difficult uh, for many of the, of, the, um, of the members of NATO to understand uh, Turkey's uh, 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 pursuit of S 400s from Russia. Uh, that said, that said, it should be noted that Turkey, of course, has been negotiating for years over technology transfer, uh, and um, and that has not always uh, been met to the uh, conditions that uh, Turkey wanted. And it should also be noted that there are a range of other uh, bids, uh, including the uh, Franco-Italian SAMP-T uh, missile defense system, which is still being negotiated and which is a very relative al uh, relevant alternative as well. Uh, for Turkey, uh, which can uh, perhaps also uh, appease some of these concerns yes. and worries in the alliance. So, Mustafa, if you look at the previous and the uh, current U.S. administration's approach to the alliance, which president do you think has hurt the NATO the most? And how has Biden's efforts to reinvigorate the alliance played out so far, especially 
after the U.S.'s chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan? Well, obviously, the first part of your, your question is quite easy to answer. It's, it's President Trump that hurt the cohesion of NATO uh, alliance quite a lot, uh, not only by his actions, but by also through his rhetoric. Uh, he picked up conflicts uh, uh, of language with many of the NATO leaders. Uh, and also, he undermined the NATO's cohesion by questioning uh, different countries' uh, contributions to NATO, as well as uh, adopting policies without really consulting with NATO members, other NATO members. President Biden, uh, I think, so far has been uh, uh, less than what he, he was expected to do. Uh, he, there was a lots of expectation, and this was also raised by the President Putin and his team, uh, sorry, President Biden and his team uh, as well before his election, that everybody was expecting him uh, to put the alliance uh, up front and, and uh, push for its more cohesion. But so far, this has not really happened yet. Maybe the changing uh, international circumstances uh, affected that. But mm -hmm. obviously, uh, the United States uh, uh, and the administration is now trying to use, in a sense, this uh, recent Ukrainian crisis uh, in order to enhance uh, NATO cohesion or membership cohesion within NATO. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether this will be helpful or not, the time will tell. Uh, but also, some of the uh, uh, critical members are seeing that the United States also is pushing its own interest yes. uh, as if it's the NATO interest. So that's not really helping the cohesion either. So, Samuel, what's your take on that? And uh, would you like to add something to Mustafa's comments? Has NATO managed to deter Russia so far? And what's next moving forward for the alliance? Well, I think uh, just to wrap up and maybe make a, a small remark on that, What's definitely needed is de-escalation in the Eastern Mediterranean. And some of the negotiations which have taken place uh, between the Turkish administration, the UAE and Israel in recent days are absolutely a positive development. Secondly, there can be no uh, functional NATO alliance without a functional Franco-Turkish uh, rapprochement. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's also important to mention that Energy it plays a key factor uh, in, in, in this decade, especially with the transition. And we have to reevaluate uh, how Turkey can be included within the Eastern Mediterranean when it comes to energy, or at least to respect uh, some of uh, the European Union's needs for energy diversification from either the Caspian or Iran, depending on the JCPOA, yes. which could or could not. Uh, include Turkey as well. Yeah, so we also remember French President Emmanuel Macron calling NATO a brain dead. So, Mustafa, in the event of a war between Russia and Ukraine, how would Turkey act? And could this be a worst-case scenario for Ankara? Obviously, yes. It's, uh, I think it's a worst-case scenario for many of the countries, including Russia and United States. Uh, but for Turkey, uh, obviously, we have a very close relationship with both Russia and Ukraine. And I would even classify Turkey's relationship to, this, to these two countries as strategic. Uh, as such, Turkey would try absolutely everything to prevent a warfare, open warfare, uh, to start in Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, between Ukraine and Russia, and also, of course, widening between Russia and the West. Because any conflict in this region and over Ukraine will not be limited only to Ukrainian territory and will not be limited only to Ukrainian forces and Russian forces. It will be expanding. Yes. And that would definitely force Turkey to choose side between two of its close and, and strategic allies or partners. Yes. And I think Turkey would absolutely try everything to avoid that kind of a choice and being cornered in that sense. Yes, and in the meantime, we'll see if Turkey can mediate between Ukraine and Russia. Gentlemen, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining me on Straight Talk.